all of the scholarly bodies, all of the Islamic centers across the world in condemning the brutal, violent acts that happened in France uh, this past week. And our hearts and our thoughts and our prayers go with the families of the victims, Muslim and non-Muslim. It's obvious that this reality that keeps coming about in the media plays it like it is the only thing that's happening in the world. It is uh, the reality that we have to deal with. And so I believe that it is a fact that to keep responding with the same cliche response, well, Islam holds life sacred, which is true, and Islam means peace, which is partly true, uh, I don't think that is the way to solve the problem. I think that is making us look like we are trying to hide something. Because at the end of the day, there is a huge, multifaceted, multi-million, dare I go into the billions, dollar movement that is trying to prove that Islam in itself, as Quran and Sunnah and law, that's been understood by all mainstream Muslims is the problem. This is what they're trying to do. This is the movement. And when you look at the response, the response is not a multifaceted billion dollar campaign to refute these claims. It's just a Muslim guy with a nice suit and tie standing there saying, well, Islam means peace. And Islam holds life sacred, right? And for most people across the world, this is not convincing. Right? What is convincing is unfortunately watching these images and reading these reports time and time and time again. Hearing now from people like Don Lemon, this is a liberal human rights uh, journalist for CNN who questioned Arsal al Ikhtikhar, a very liberal uh, Muslim who works in international human rights. He asked him, do you support ISIS? He was serious. This was a serious question. If, if they're concerned that he, surely all of us, right? This is the reality we're dealing with. So we have to go a little bit deeper. We have to formulate an understanding of our religion. So the first thing we need to do is to all together to make jihad. We have to make a jihad to properly understand and disseminate the noble concept of jihad. The word jihad, as we will see, is a very crucial crux concept to being a believer. And anybody who understands jihad that is not a Muslim will respect the <coughs> noble emphasis that it brings to an individual and to a society. But we are not making that case. Many of us are not able to, many of us are able, and we're not working day and night and putting all kinds of money into making sure that that case is made. We have to make crystal clear with a long dissertation <laughs> and evidences and proof as to why these acts that were done in France and all of the other ones like it have nothing to do with Islam and don't represent Islam. Because the common folk, many people in France, went attacking mosques, mosques as a result. Meaning what? It is Islam, the mosque, which is where all the common folks go. This is what we're holding accountable. You see the correlation here? <coughs> this is what they've done. That's what they think. And so we have to stop this with the proper understanding of jihad. The word jihad as a linguistic concept, it means this struggle, this striving, this putting forth one's effort in general. That's the Arabic. <coughs> the Islamic terminology is talking about struggling against the corruption and evil of the world to bring about peace and tranquility and respect for the divine reality, right? That's what the concept of jihad is all about in our scripture. The Prophet ﷺ, as mentioned in the various authentic hadiths, he clarified the concept, <laughs> Al-Mujahidu Man Jahada Nafsa. The Prophet ﷺ said, the person who is struggling and striving for righteousness, first and foremost, is struggling and striving against their self, their ego, their desire to be the one who's right, the one who doesn't want to be uh, challenged or refuted or being told that they're wrong or that their way is not the best, right? This is the ultimate jihad. Because
because people want desire, they want to be superior, they want to be correct, they want to be above reproach. Every single one of us is flawed, we have shortcomings, we have weaknesses. <laughs> we need to emphasize this point almost in every khutbah and every thought because the Muslims worldwide have a big problem with this issue. This is, what, this is the beginning of the jihad, to struggle against ourselves, to not let ourselves to become something that is in need of not fixing its own self, right? This is the problem that it began with. The second aspect of jihad, some, some scholars, some great scholars, said very incorrect, foolish things in our history. Some of the scholars said in the books of Thuk, a jihad yutlaq ala al-qital. You, you see the statement that the concept of struggling in the Holy Quran is always understood in the context of fighting a battle against the occupying or invading or tyrannical forces around you. Right? This is what they said. But in fact, I will give you a couple examples and there are more. And we can go on. We don't have a whole hour, two hours, 15, 20 hours to go, which we can and we will, inshallah ta'ala, deal with this matter. And we should invite our neighbors and families and friends uh, to have a really deep understanding. But there are two surahs which were not revealed <coughs> in Medina, in which the, the Prophet and the companions were given the right to defend themselves and fight back against the constant threat of the polytheists and then later, unfortunately, the Jewish tribes who joined and treacherously worked against them with military might. Right? So we have Surah al furqan and we have Surah al ankabut These two surahs, according to all of the scholars of Tafsir, Surah Makkiyya. These are surahs revealed in Mecca. So the last ayah of Surah al ankabut وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Right? So this ayah is deep in understanding the concept of jihad as a foundational reality of jihad. Those who struggle and strive in the divine cause for the sake of God, then He will guide them to the many paths to heaven, the many ways the merciful has made for that huge straight path with many people with varying interpretation and cultural backgrounds to go to heaven on it, right? So he says, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And he defined who those people are as muhsinin. The muhsin is the one that is striving for spiritual and character excellence towards the ones around them. To be a source of compassion and mercy and goodness and spreading of well-being to the others that I am living amongst. That's muhsin. That's the meaning of it. So it defines this jihad as uh, cultivating in a person this ihsan, this spiritual and character excellence. Then in Surah Al-Furqan, we see the Holy Quran told us and commanded us, And struggle and strive against these disbelievers with it, with a huge effort of struggling and striving. All of the scholars of Tafsir, because this is Surah Makkiyya, they said it is referring to the Holy Qur'an. You see? And we've emphasized and we will continue to emphasize until there is a change in the way we do things because we require revivalist reform as a nation because we've fallen into a dark ages with very confused priorities and misunderstandings of our religion because of some cultural <laughs> corruption and corrosion that we see across the Muslim world. Right? And so, this Qur'an needs to be understood. We need to have competitions of depths of understanding of the linguistic and metaphorical and deep guidance-based meanings of this Qur'an. It is not going to make somebody a righteous Muslim simply to memorize and recite beautifully the Qur'an. That is an aspect of respecting and loving and being attached to the Qur'an. But the purpose the primary purpose mentioned in the beginning after we make our prayer to guide us is Dina Salat al-Musliqeen ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَةِ هُدَى هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ This is the book, there's no doubt about it. Its purpose is not recitation and memorization, it is guidance. It is guidance. It's meant to guide the people. The Muslims across the world, we see a problem with this. Let's talk about
about the particular people who we see. If you have not studied this, you should study it to know. These two guys, Sharif and uh, Ahmed or Amadi uh, and another one, there's two uh, guys that are brothers. These are orphans from Algeria, born in a ghetto in France, in the hood. And you can see rap videos with them glorifying drinking alcohol and getting with girls. These two guys. The way they're picturing it is you have some brothers like our brother here, mashallah, coming to the mosque every day praying, and then this is how they do because Sharia leads them to this. This is how they're picturing it. But these are troubled youth. From the beginning, their psychology, their environment led them to this. And another one, the African convert, he was just in jail for many crimes like drugs and alcohol and so forth. Recently, this is the other one that they had in the kosher bakery. These are the people, just like this mentally challenged character in, in more Oklahoma who beheaded some lady in and out of jail his whole life for general crimes. These are who these people are. They're not devout Muslims. These are troubled people that unfortunately the mock reality and culture did not bedrock them and cultivate a environment that they could grow and learn their religion properly. Rather they went on Sheikh Google and found a bunch of people talking about jihad with no understanding of the religion and now we see how we're all paying for it. But do we have some responsibility? Is it that the way that people judge people in the mosques, right? Is that not a reality what led them not to grow properly? Because I sat down on many occasions with the FBI in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we had long discussions. And we invited them to our, to our mosque. And I convinced other imams, let them in your mosque, welcome them. Don't have them come in as secret agents and all that. Tell them, come to the mosque. We have nothing to hide, there's no problem, come on in. But don't say we have nothing to hide, because that looks weird. Right? <laughs> One time the brother, he did that. Said, don't mind him, he's concerned about uh, what you might do to him. Guantanamo looks like a scary place. So they came to a conclusion, and they made a report. Imam John, we have been in the mosque and talking to the people and looking about and collecting intelligence. The extremist radicalization of people is not happening in the mosque as far as a violent form, right? It's happening on the internet. It's happening on the internet. People are just going here and there. Certain guys like Anwar al awlaqi who is like one of the main founders of a lot of these people because he was previously a mainstream great speaker with great spiritual upliftment and then he lost his way and went completely against the understanding of Ahl al-Sunnah wa jamaa on how to solve the world's problems. <coughs> right? So the people are connecting to people like this because they're not connecting with the mosque. I would say there is a radicalization in mosques that's different. It's not violent. It's just uh, sectarian. It's divisive. It's judgmental. <coughs> it's not allowing people to grow at their own pace. It's not welcoming to the, ha the other half of our community, women, right? All the, many women complain to me about how our mosque is, and they don't feel comfortable or welcome, right? These are the mothers of our children who will be raising them. These are the people, right? <coughs> wondering what happened to the youth. Well, these are the mothers that are raising them. They don't feel like they can come to the mosque and benefit because of the culture of the mosque. This is their statement, not mine. This is what they have said. <coughs> so we have a lot of issues to fix within ourselves. So if we look, I went to uh, give a cultural and religious training at the FBI in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I did this test on them. I told them, I said, okay, raise your hand if you think what I'm about to say is a good, noble concept. They said, okay. So I went through all the jihad and If <coughs> you're thinking, uh, you know, you want to get mad in a discussion and, and physically harm somebody or cuss them out or yell at them, but you control yourself, you keep calm with yourself, this is not the way to function. Everybody said, that's good. Okay? What about uh, some woman who's not your wife and you know that you're married or you're not married and you should be married and you have this desire to pursue her and you say to yourself, no, I'm not going to do this. This is not becoming of a believer. Right? Everybody raised their hand. Good. We went on many of those. I said, okay, what about the police department protecting society from the criminals and all that? Everybody raise their hand. Fire department, everybody raise their hand. Do we need a sending military to protect our country? Yes, everybody agreed. And I asked, what if there is a tyrannical leader in a neighboring country, and you have a strong military, and those people are all oppressed, and you can help them? Everybody raise their hand. So I said, what you've just now done 
as you all confirmed every aspect of jihad as it is in Islam. You have all said it's a good, noble thing. If I were to use the word jihad, you would have all just been shy to raise your hand, right? Because of the power of words and how people are brainwashing people rather than understanding the concept. And many people were just flabbergasted by this. They were confused, right? And that's because we are not talking to the masses. We are not properly, like I said, we go on the news, Islam means peace. Islam holds life sacred. Listen, don't, and then the guy keeps attacking and attacking. Why? Because he's not buying that one, right? We have to go up there with nuance, with depth, and we have that. But a huge, versatile, amazing, rich tradition of scholarship in Islam that needs to be tapped for this. So, uh, this concept of jihad as understood as a military form, over the whole 14 centuries of Islam, according to all schools of thought, is in no way differing from what the UN and international agreements are about the concept of a just war and war engagement. Is that not interesting? This is, this is a standing challenge to anybody who would try to say otherwise. And we'll see some evidence specifically on this point. As American Muslims, as people who have chosen to make this as our home, there are legal, effective means to promoting good morality, to combating <coughs> anti-Islamism and Islamophobia. There are so many ways. There are so many keys to human rights development that have been proven by different groups, like the black American community, like women, like the gay movement. There are people who went from, we don't, you don't have rights, we don't respect you, you're not even a truly a part of our society, you're not even a full human being, they said, right? Now these people are respected and becoming president and this and that, all the states accepting their reality and everything. It wasn't just poof, it was hard work understanding the system and working it to their benefit, which led to those realities. It is high time for Muslims to embrace this reality and learn and develop all of us. We have the insha'Allah disorder which is a disgrace to the word, to the phrase. Insha'Allah. Insha I agree with that. Then we go back to our dunya and our things get busy and we forget about <coughs> our purpose. It is incumbent upon every person living here to be doing something with their time and their self and their wealth. Jahadu bi amwalihim wa anfusihim fi subhidillah to properly deal with this constant attack on Muslims. If we do it properly, I can promise you, all of the nonsense on the media will be eradicated by the political movement as well as the viewers and listeners who say, we don't want to hear this garbage and junk. We know Muslims. We have neighbors who are Muslims. We have co-workers who are Muslims. We know who they are because we have very good relationships with them. And we've had these discussions and looked at their scripture. And this is not, you're not portraying them correctly, right? This is how the reality changed. They used to vilify the, the average mainstream doctor and politician and respectful person used to treat all black people in a certain way and accuse black people as the cause of all of our problems and so forth. This was a reality in America. It was worse than what we're going through right now. Much worse. They can't even use the same water fountain, they're saying. You see what I'm saying? So we, there's a proven system how to struggle and strive and attain our rights and our reality. So, let's deal directly with this particular <coughs> concept of heretical, uh, vigilante, wannabe jihadism that we just saw in front, and we've seen it time and time again. These things are people who come and live in a non-Muslim land, and they get citizenship, green card, uh, visa, whatever it is, and they live there, and then they make these plots, and they do these things. Right? In Islamic law, the visa, the citizenship, the green card is all considered an aqd or an aqd. It is a covenant, a oath, a contract that you have made between you and someone else and you, that is binding upon you. And so when you live somewhere or pass through there according to these means, in Islamic law, this becomes a binding oath upon us that we have to fulfill. And all of those oaths understood in them and written in them very clearly is you are a peaceful citizen. You are a peaceful worker. You are a peaceful who will respect the laws of the land and the people in the land that you chose to live in. This is, this is paramount understanding of dealing with this situation. 
for the sake of argument, because there is no scholar and there is no Muslim leader or government that has made a war with the U.S. or France or anybody like this. But let's say for the sake of argument, to please move up so that the people here can find, there's still plenty of room in here. For the sake of argument, even if this was, even if there were scholarly bodies and leaders of Muslim countries who said, Muslims must be at war with America, or Muslims must be at war with France. Even if that was the case, which it is not the case, what does Islamic law say about this? Once again, it goes back to the concept of oath. The Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, awfu bil uqood. O you who believe, fulfill all your contracts and covenants. Wa awfu bil ahdi, inna al ahda kana mas'ula. And fulfill your covenant, you will be asked and responsible on the day of judgment according to your uh, covenants and things that you have given your oath to do. In another verse, Allah Azza wa Jal, He calls these people who break their oaths as the rebellious sinners, and He says that these are the people who spread mischief, and they are the ones who are doomed to hell. الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِثَاقِهِ وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلْ وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُولَئِكَ لَهُمُ اللَّعْنَةُ وَلَهُمْ سُوءُ الدَّارِ The Qur'an says, those who go around breaking their covenants and contracts that Allah has commanded them to keep up and they cause mischief and corruption in the earth, those are cursed and they will be doomed to hell. This is the Qur'an speaking here about who would break their covenant. So the question might come, somebody says, well, is this covenant, is this an obligation upon me even though they're supporting Israel and whatever else and so forth. The Hanbali scholar Ibn Qudama, who wrote al mughni which is a 14 volume long treatise to establish one of the schools of thought of Islamic law, he says in volume 10, page 555, whenever there is a covenant given to a Muslim in the enemy land, it is forbidden for them to kill or harm those people or take their wealth. This is Ibn Qudama, long before America existed. So we have this concept of Mu'ahad, the Mustatman, the one who is not Muslim and is in a special contract with the Muslims. So all of the citizens of Muslim countries who are non-Muslim, all of those who came there on visa, all of the people here where we're living amongst, those are all Mu'ahad and Mustatman. The Prophet says, مَنْ قَتَلَ مُعَاهَدًا فَلَنْ يَشُمْ رَأِحَ الْجَنَّةِ And so this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, hadith number 3166. Whoever would kill, whoever would kill a non-Muslim who has a covenant with the Muslims, they will never smell the fragrance of heaven. The Prophet ﷺ damned these people who claim that they're following Islam doing jihad. So clearly they're not following Islam or doing jihad. So one of the great founders of the four schools of thought, Imam al-Shafi'i, he has a book called Al-Um. This book is the foundation for legal principles in Islamic law in volume 4, page 292. If the enemy captures a Muslim and imprisons him, and after that they release him and give him security and they allow him to live among them, the covenant they give to him is binding on him by Islamic law. It is not allowed for him to assassinate them or betray them. And we do not know any scholar in Islam who has mentioned otherwise. You see? This is the real analysis that John Bennett has not heard, that so forth has not heard and don't know. It is our fault. And all our scholars fault that are here for not making a big concerted effort. This is the third time I've given this khutbah, so alhamdulillah alladhi hadani al Okay? But I'm questioning how many others are giving such sermon and how many Muslims are taking notes to try to make sure that they can properly discuss this with your very well-informed and talking point anti-Islam person. Shaykh Salman al Oda of Saudi Arabia, one of the senior scholars, he said, commenting on this, Muslim scholars have stated that those who enter non-Muslim countries have to adhere to the respective laws and regulations, even if they enter that country illegally, which they shouldn't have done in the first place. And they have no excuse for breaking those laws, since they were entrusted to abide by those laws upon entry of those countries. So all those who didn't pay your taxes, you better set up your taxes. Okay? Yeah. If you don't have car insurance, you're going to have to get car insurance. It's a law. Right? As long as a Muslim agrees to live in a non-Muslim country, he is never to rebel against the people in his choice of residence. Sheikh Salman al-Auda of Saudi Arabia. 
Allah Hafizullah. So these are our scholars. This is the proper understanding of the mainstream majority or consensus of Islamic scholarship. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all, forgive us all, and inspire us all. So the fact of the matter is we shouldn't have to condemn or whatever these type of things because they have nothing to do with us. We are not guilty. They have nothing to do with us. We shouldn't have to. But we do have to because we have not done our obligation in properly presenting to the masses the case that is being charged against us. We're in a court. And the plaintiffs have brought all kinds of evidence, ayahs, hadith, and physical acts of people who say, I'm following Islam, jihad is my mission, and this is what I'm doing. You see? That's their case. The response, the defendant, us, have not made the case that that is all false. And proven it without a shadow of a doubt. Even, you know, nowadays they say, you know, if there's any doubt, then they shouldn't judge us, but that's not how it works in the court of the media. The court of the media is a constant brainwashing day in and day out, and we have to work to be a part of the solution. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we become people who are dedicated to Islam, and that we all struggle and strive proper understanding of jihad, and disseminating the concept of jihad, and defending the concept of jihad, because it is part and parcel of Islam, and it is a noble concept that everyone should embrace who is a Muslim. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings, weaknesses, and laziness in our religion. We ask Him to motivate us and inspire us and to bring us to see that great example of the companions of the Prophet and that we become those who follow the Prophet as they did in this day and age according to our time as if this was the place that the Prophet was living in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we come to realize the huge blessing we have in the preservation of the detailed understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we embrace our Islamic centers and that we build and we cultivate and we have an open-hearted, uh, loving, compassionate attitude towards our fellow brothers and sisters in Islam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring our hearts together for the purpose of serving Him and the purpose of serving the message by which we we were all sent. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve the Muslims all over the world of arrogance and ignorance and oppression, corruption and turmoil, and to bring from us and by us a goodness and a peace and a tranquility that the world can come to love and respect and uh, see the dignity in it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and blessings and mercy upon his final messenger Muhammad. Muhammad wa الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا Said, so fill in the first row and then make another row. You should not stand behind the middle if the, there are rows that have not been completed uh, in front of you. Does that fall off?
الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره المشركون هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره الكافرون يا أيها الذين آمنوا هل أدلكم على تجارة تنجيكم من عذاب أليم تؤمنون بالله ورسوله وتجاهدون في سبيل الله بأموالكم وأنفسكم ذلكم خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون يغفر لكم ذنوبكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن ذلك الفوز العظيم وأخرى تحبونها نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين الله أكبر سمع الله لما سحمد الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Just give me a couple of minutes, inshallah, of your valuable time. Uh, the first thing is, inshallah ta'ala, tonight we have a program about developing the Muslim identity and character, concept of sukh, 